believe that it's, 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 it's very, I believe it's the word of the Lord for where we're at in our country and where we're at really in the earth. And I want you to look at Psalm 78, and I want to look at verse 9, and then I'll, I'll get to preaching here. But it says this. How many of you are there? You wave your hand at me when you're there. Notice what it says. It says, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. How many got that? The tribe or the children of Ephraim. Notice, underline it. They were what? They were armed. So were they equipped? Did they have a way to fight? Yes, they had bows. But they turned back in the midst of the battle. This is where I believe that some have become in our great nation, the United States. It's why I believe that every Sunday pastors stick their head in the sand and act like nothing is going on in the battles that you face on a day-to-day basis. Where was your congregations? Where are the people of God that push back? When everything else was allowed to be open except the church house. Here we are, the most equipped people on the face of the earth, God's church. And what did we do? We forgot our authority. We forgot the power that we have that has been invested in us through Yeshua. And some turned back from the battle, and they still have turned back from the battle, and they refuse to acknowledge that there is sex trafficking going on in our country. They believe the media over the word of God. They believe the lies of whatever is spoken in the newspapers, the fake news, and upon the television screens of the fake media. And they forget that what they're listening to is to cause certain narratives to form ideologies in your mind, to bring a veil of deception so that you will believe their narratives. Why? Because they know that you have power, you have influence. And if you discover it, God forbid you use it, they have no chance in their onslaught against your children, your freedoms. They want you to turn from the battle. That's why they shut you down while they continue to get filthy rich. They want you to turn from the battle. They want you to shut down your churches. So they call you all kinds of dirty names. You're a Christian nationalist. Can I tell you, I don't even know what that is. What, I love God in my country? They call you a fascist. What is that? They insult you, threaten you, try everything they can to get you to turn from the battle. And you know what? Sadly, I have watched pastors act as though there is no enraging battle for the future of this country. I had a pastor tell me a few months back. He said, I just stay in my calling. And my calling is to preach the gospel. And my calling is to teach the word. And I said, really? How is that any different than my calling? Didn't Jesus tell me also to go in the world and preach the gospel? He said, well, yes. I said, but you know what the difference between you and me is? He said, what? I said, you're so busy trying to stay in your calling, you won't even have a calling or the ability to express your calling if you don't do what I'm doing. I have the same calling. I'm staying in my calling, but I realize unless I engage the battle, you will not have a freedom. And while you're sitting there staying in your calling, others are putting our lives on the line so that you and your church can stay open. You are afraid. You fear man. You fear your 
reputation and you fear the money of the people. That's why you're a coward. There is a fight upon us as a people. I remember in my neighborhood, I was the only one flying the American flag. And people would say to me, are you afraid? I said, afraid of what? Well, you know, people are burning the flag. People are hostile. Haven't you heard how they're protesting the national anthem? I said, why don't you then look in the eyeballs of our great soldiers and veterans that they put their life on the line in the battle so you could fly that flag and pledge your allegiance to God and your country. And these were veterans that were saying this to me. I said, what has happened to you? You swore that you would defend God and country, and you can't fly your flag. You have turned from the battle. Well, we don't want to make anybody mad. They don't care about making you mad. They don't care about taking your freedoms. It is all to get you to back up. And here's what's sad. Ephraim was absolutely armed. They had everything they needed, including God, to win. The United States of America was not birthed in a wuss spirit. It was not birthed by cowards. It was birthed by people who said we are acknowledging that tyrants are destroying our freedom. We must do whatever it takes to rise up and fight for our independence. What am I saying? America, the United States, was not birthed to be a cowardly people. Yet it grieves my heart. You have Jesus. The Bible calls him a warrior. You can read it in Exodus 15, verse 3. Revelation 19 says the Lord is a warrior. He's come to judge and to make war. And here he has given us all authority and all power in his name. And yet churches, evangelicals, are the problem. Is it really that hard? Name me one person besides 45 that is America first. And has been America. It should not be evangelicals, church, that hard. Well, I don't like his personality. Well, I sure as hell don't like the personality of those that are trying to steal our country. I would rather have a man stand up and say it like it is, and if it offends people in the truth, so be it. The onslaught and the fight that has come against us, we need someone like this that is not afraid to say it on your behalf. And really, he's just saying what we all want to say. But we're too behaved as Christians. Don't you know you should turn the other cheek? Listen, I've exhausted all four of my cheeks with this liberal agenda and stinking rhinos. I've turned them all. This country belongs to God. But evangelicals, you will be the problem it will come on the evangelical community if we don't see our country turn. You're just extending the goalposts. No, I'm talking reality. You know why? How can any candidate be placed in their rightful position if the church doesn't pray, if the church is in controversy and confused over who the rightful candidate is, and you've got a guy who honored Israel 
in 45. you got a man who acknowledges and says the name of Jesus more than any other wimpy candidate that seeks to rise up in that position. you got a candidate that put the embassy in Jerusalem when others just talked about it. You have a president that stood up and absolutely stared in the face of tyrants of other countries and said, you will not mess with us. He put in the very Supreme Court justices, pro-life candidate. We fought for the right of the unborn. And then how sick those that were born even up to a year, they could kill them. We fought for that. And we won. And here's what's sad. The E-frame churches and pastors, you couldn't hardly find any of them that got up when Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. There wasn't a mention from the pulpits. Because you've turned from the battle. And you're letting the fight be upon those who are taking all of the hits while you play coward in your churches, in your Christianity, in your evangelical expression. Evangelicals, listen to me. It's a known fact. If we would just show up, they couldn't even attempt. There's too many of us. Well, he's so mean. Oh, yeah, if we could be in the... Shotgun seat in your car. We'd see how mean you are in traffic, too. And when you don't get your way, how you turn into Jezebel in your house. And the kids and the husband. Oh, my goodness, here comes Crapella. I can't say that about the men because too many men are wusses. You won't stand for anything, men. You'll stand up for your favorite team. For your favorite sports figure. But you won't stand up for God and his church and for those that are standing for your freedom. Too many have turned from the battle. Come on, it shouldn't be this hard. You know why they went after the church? Come on, why did they go after the strip clothes to shut them down? Why did they go after the taverns to shut them down? Because they know that there is a spirit on the evangelical Christian community. It's called the wuss spirit. They will know we are Christians by our love. Marches to your concentration camps. They will know that we are Christians by our love. Put a mask on our mouth and tell us what to do. We are sheep led to a slaughter because we're Christians by our love. Love is not compliance. going to comply when it violates the word of God or how about this when you're being manipulated lied to but they did that to us they shut down the churches because they knew we would cooperate how do you know pastor because there's churches still shut down never reopened Are we going to be like Ephraim? I want to show you this. Look at Genesis 48. Am I preaching too hard? Okay, I'm just checking, you know. Don't mix religion with politics. Well, you didn't know about Ephraim then, because Ephraim actually became the political and religious capital at the time. Look at Genesis 48, 12 through 13. Joseph took the boys by hand. Deeply to him, so this is Jacob, brought him to his, Joseph brought his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to, to Jacob. Now watch this. Ephraim at Israel's left hand. So Ephraim was on the left. Manasseh was on the right. Look at verse 14. Underline this word. But is 
Israel crossed his arms. Notice the cross. This is a sign of redemption right here. Cross. He put his right hand on Manasseh. Or I'm sorry, Ephraim. And he put his left hand then on Manasseh. He crossed it. It should have been Manasseh's. But he puts it on Ephraim. And he makes the sign of the cross. He crossed his arms. And Jacob began to tell Joseph, and by the way, Joseph was angry. And he said, he prophesies, he says, listen, Joseph, Manasseh will become a people. And in the Hebrew, a people is that you will become the people. In other words, you will be a people, God's people. But when he prophesies over Ephraim, he uses a Hebrew word that means Gentiles. You will be a multitude of nations. So God knew what he was doing. Israel will be blessed. Ephraim will be blessed, the Gentiles. And God extended this blessing. Now look, look here. I want you to see this. Go back to verse 9. The children of Ephraim being armed carrying bows. Here they had the blessing of God. Here they had a divine inheritance, but what did they do? Someone shout it. They turned back from the battle. Now look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 48, out of the Amplified. It says, when the Philistines rose and came forward to meet David, watch what David did. David ran quickly towards the battle line. We shouldn't be having to think about whether we should engage our culture when they're trying to insult what God said about what traditional marriage is. We shouldn't have to sit back with the observatory great wisdom and observation whether a man is a man if he's got man stuff And if a woman's got woman stuff that they're biologically created by God, we shouldn't have to, it shouldn't be this hard to figure it out. The angels of the Lord in the tomb, after Jesus rose from the dead and Mary comes, notice what the angel said, woman, what did you come out to see? See, God and the spiritual kingdom that has Spiritual sense knows what a man is and what a woman is. It's us when we lose our spiritual sense. We start becoming Christian. I'm not speaking hate. I'm talking what God said. Man, woman. Man, woman are to be married. No other definition. You a man, you a woman. Biologically. Well, I don't like the way that I was born. Then get born again. That's the problem. Look at what Hebrews 10 verse 38 says. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draws back, if any man draws back, if any man draws back, especially when you have God who is a jealous God in heaven, And he's looking and we are questioning whether a Christian nation, United States, if it's okay if people put false idols up in your White House. But they've got great policy. What about God's policy? Thou shall have no other gods before me, number one. But where is the sound of the church? We sit there and let these people who are elected officials push the race card. Push their liberal agenda, rhinos who are wusses. And we the people keep voting them in. We give them a voice. Because it's easier to return from the battle, cast your vote, and let them just deal with all the mess. Well, look at what we got for it. You better start standing up, all of us. And saying enough is enough, we are not going to stand for this garbage in our country. (laughs) 
when they push the race card, you need to look at them and say, excuse me, unacceptable. It's so bad, we can't even get police officers to want to work our cities anymore. Because if you're a police officer, you're automatically bad because didn't you know that police officers are out shooting folk? Yeah, that's true. But that's not all of them. Psalm 78, look at here again. The children of Ephraim, being armed, carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his word. You know there are covenants that God made with this land that people refuse. I, I, man, I lost friends. I'm offending you and I hope so. Because we have turned from the battle. We don't have a backbone anymore. You say, well, Pastor Hank, you're offending me. Really? I have a right to speak this way. You know why? I used to read, used to read. I used to read Newsweek. I used to read Time Magazine. I used to read Life Magazine. I used to read those magazines. Now, I'm headline news. So don't tell me that I'm offending you. If the voice of righteousness is not louder than the voice of evil, you will never see change. That's why you're mad at 45. Because his voice is loud. Thank God. Here's what's sad about Ephraim. Look at it. Look at it. Let's go back. They did not keep covenant. They refused to walk in his word and forgot God's works and his wonders. All of this caused them to turn back in the day of battle. Here's what's sad. Do you know who the Ephraim, Ephraimites were related to? They had it in their DNA. Are you ready? Let me show you who they were related to. In our DNA as Americans, United States citizens, people that live here, it's in the very fiber of our country. The home of the free and the brave. It's our DNA that when we get pushed around, we stand up. Okay, five of you. I want you to look here. I know I'm being tough, but you know what I prayed? I prayed my butt and your butt would get kicked tonight. I hope I make you so angry you will absolutely do something now. You that are watching. Look here. Numbers 13. Look at who Joshua said. Look at who Ephraim. It says, of the tribe, verse 8. Of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun. So, of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun. So you can see who Nun was. He was of the tribe of Ephraim. Now look at Numbers 14, 6. And Joshua, the son of who? Nuns. So, Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. Joshua was a warrior. Joshua was a fighter. Joshua was willing to lay everything on the line, no matter how big the giants were. He said, they're bread for us. That's why I never get discouraged. Never, never, ever quit. I want to show you this. Look at Matthew chapter 13. I'm going to get ready to close this. Look at Matthew 13, verse 25. Here's the problem. 
We need an awakening, but you know what we need an awakening right now is in God's people. Because it says, while men slept. Notice what the enemy does. You know why we have this problem? Because we sat there and we slept. Do you know your history? You say, oh, Pastor Hank, you know what you're talking about. No. My good friend, Bishop Harry R. Jackson, is in heaven. The finest black man you would ever want to meet. I knew him 17 years. He had his family lynched. And he would sit down with me and say, I want to show you as a white man, first and foremost, what the black people went through in this country. And I said, do you know, Bishop, that my ministry started among the black population at 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And I had a love for them, and I still do. He said, yeah, but you need to understand not only what they went through, because he said, you will understand their story. But he said, at the same time, he said, you need to understand how they have been lied to by the Democratic Party. Okay, six people. No, I'm going to still vote Democrat because that's what grandma does. And, 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 and if I don't vote Democrat, and even though they're the party of the non-religious, they're the party of the transgender, they're the party of homosexuality, the party of Planned Parenthood, the party of abortion, and you find it biblically and morally in your conscience to stay Democrat because you are afraid, whether you are white, black, red, yellow, to offend someone in your family? What about God? <laughs> Cowardly preachers, no power, no boldness, no confrontation. Everything is nice. Yeah, and they're the same churches that shut down, stayed shut down. So all the corporate models going on, and I'm looking and I'm going, well, I don't see any of those corporate models in the Bible. The church grew by preaching, teaching, healing the sick, and casting out devils. Correct? That's how God did it, and through some persecution. But what I watch with pastors is, and I watch it in our city, the big thing from the corporate model is Saturday night churches, and then everybody started Saturday night churches. How many remember when that was a trend? Now you go back, there's very few that still do Saturday night churches. Right? That was the trend. Here's another one. We are going to throw our ties away, and we are literally going to be the cool, hip pastor. We're going to come out in shorts that are so tight that you reveal that you are a man biologically. <laughs> Disgusting. And i got to have my tank top so that you can see my muscles because I'm in love with my flesh. And i got to be pastor hip. And i got to come out because i got to relate to you. i got to be just like you. And they lowered themselves. Let's just all get casual. And you know what happened when they got casual in their dress? They got casual in their services. Now coffee is the number one drawing card to the church. Come experience our coffee. Throw the coffee away. I want God. Let's all make it real casual, real nice. And then here's the biggest lie. Come as you are. And here's the underlining message to that. Stay as you are. Because I'm Pastor Wuss. I have no power to cast out devils. No, you read the book of Corinthians. Paul mentions about idolaters, homosexuals, and he says, such were some of you. Your job is they can come, 
as they are. But in my church and in God's church, you are not going to stay the way you came. You're going to repent. You're going to become more like Christ. You're going to take on his image. And you are going to turn from your sin. Oh, no, we got to, you come as you are, you stay as you are. Let's not offend anyone. And here's the biggest one. This is the most dipstick model of them all. And I'm going to make you very mad. You know what it is? We're a soul winning church. I've had pastors tell me that. I said, well, what does that mean? Oh, we don't bring up anything. We're all about the lost here. I said, so your, feet, your sheep are starving? You got anemic sheep because you're so about your fishing pole on Sundays? I said, you got it backwards. The Bible says the reason, Ephesians 4, 11, you are set in your office is to equip those people that are coming every Sunday. To do the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Get your butt out of the four walls of the church and go get the fish. The four walls of the church was never meant to be compromised for the sake of the loss so your, your sheep get starved every week. Oh, my God. We're, can we just erase this? What did you come out to see? When people start turning from the battle, they start bending towards trends. I remember the big one was the pastors that wear the Hawaii Five-O shirts. In Omaha, Nebraska, we all got to look cool. And so I went to Brenda. I said, man, I love looking nice for God. I said, you think I should go? And, and you know, I said, God forbid, I'm never going to show my legs. That's only for your enjoyment, honey. <laughs> so, so, no, let's stop, stop. You're getting visions, and that's wrong. Okay. Oh, you can say it. Go ahead. Uh, or, or whatever you do. Uh, or, or. Okay. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. But here's the thing. She said, you need to go pray about that. So I did. I went to the Lord. You know what he said to me? He said, let me ask you a question. He said, when you see a dignitary, do you see them come out with tank tops and shorts and address the State of the Union? Unless you're the guy that's, America is 200 years old. They have 200 leg hairs. And every Thanksgiving, we're going to gobble it up. America, we're going to mock and gobble it up. But then here's what God said. You ready? He said, who implemented the dress code for the priesthoods in the Bible? It was God down to their underwear. They were told by God how to dress so that it would bring a holy honor that the, that person who was dressed for God, that ministered to God, ministered to you, was a holy man. Not just so casual, we're so hip, we now become secular Christian centered. All right, that's number one. Look at the second one. You know the reason why some people turn from the battle? Right here. He said, what'd you come out to see? A king clothed in soft linen. In other words, you just like it soft. Soft Christian center. Soft presentation. Soft music. Soft messages. And every time, and I'm not saying that is out of balance, because there's a place for that. I'm saying if that's all you're getting as your diet, over time you're going to turn from the battle. And before you know it, you've gotten soft. Now you are arguing on social media over stuff that you know better. There was a day that you used to stand up, but now you're afraid of your relatives. You're afraid of controversy. You're afraid of backlash. You're afraid of what people say. Who cares? The church has lost its backbone. Amen. I 
was going to share another word. I'm going to have to preach another word another time. I was going to show you a prophetic word, but it's, it just doesn't fit. doesn't fit. You say, well, what's the answer? I'm going to show you what the answer is. All right, you ready? Look at Romans chapter 9, verses 27 through 29, and you can stand your feet on this. Got to let you go. I don't even know what time it is. Oh, man, we got to let you go. Is it that late? How many of you got something out of this? Is it 1030? Are you kidding me? What time is it? Oh, you know what? I just realized I, I, I pulled this watch out of daylight savings. No, I did. I found it in my drawer, and I didn't realize this is a daylight savings one. Okay. <laughs> I was in a hurry. I was packing. <laughs> okay. It, it, it is at 1030. Is it 1030? Oh, my God. 9.30, but it's 10.30 in the East Coast. There you go. All right, here we go. <laughs> Look at Judges, what did I say, 9? Romans, Romans now I know I need to be done. Okay. <laughs> Romans 9. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel, this is how much we as evangelicals, Christians, come on. We be as the sand on the sea. Do you know how many Christ-confessing Christians there are in our country? That ought to be enough just by our prayer alone that can shift our nation. But too many have turned from the battle. Watch. But a remnant shall be what? So God always has a remnant. What's that? A small group. Do you know our revolution, the United States independence, our revolution, that our great patriots fought? Do you know the percentage they said actually fought for this country? Three percent. That's exactly where it's at today. Just let somebody else fight. That's why I pastors. I'm just staying in my calling. I'm just, well, you're staying in your calling while everybody else has to fight. I give you one closing verse. Numbers 32. Verses 6. I believe it's uh, 6 through 7. That might be it. See if they can put that up. Numbers 32. Here's the question. Moses came to the people. And he said these words, he said, to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, shall your brethren go to war? Now, I got to say this, we are not talking insurrection. That's right. Isn't it sad you even got to say that? Shall your brethren go to war? In other words, shall your brethren stand up and say, no, we're not going to comply to this isn't a law. While you what? Sit here, opt out, leave our country alone. If we turn from the battle, God forbid what we will be as a nation. Notice what happens in verse 7. If you sit back from the battle, it's contagious. Why do you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord gave them? People who withdraw from the battle who don't do anything, who play pastor, safe Christian center, you go to a church where the pastor is afraid to say anything about the fight that you face on a day-to-day basis. You know what it does to real preachers that are out there that are fighting with every breath? It brings a discouragement. Because they're afraid to risk. I want to pray this. 
I felt like God visited us. I felt like we prayed for the nation ahead of time, but I want to close with this. Pastor Brenda, would you come up here? I think I'm running out of gas. Is that okay? I think I need to go to bed. <laughs> okay. I'm just being human. Sometimes people don't realize it. And, I, and I'll say this to you ministers. You know this. Sometimes that anointing, it gets on you, and it is very heavy on your physical body. But here's what I want to leave you with. I want to pray a boldness on all of us. I'm not here to put you on blast. What I'm here to challenge you. I said some very bold things, but I believe that they were very honest and said in good taste. Challenge you to think. Challenge you to wake up. Challenge us all to fight together. But I want to pray a boldness on you. Because that's one of the things when the church was being persecuted in Acts 4. You know what? They, they, they didn't pray for more cowardness. They gathered together. You know, that's, a, that's the hardest thing anymore is just to get the church to come together. I guarantee you there's probably people on social media that are keyboard warriors disagreeing what I'm saying. That's what's so sad about it is they will fight for their right to show that they've turned from the battle. 